This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Studio Epsilon Lecture. Today, we have uh, a very special guest, um, uh, uh, Graham Howard, who will be talking to us uh, from uh, London. It's uh, early morning uh, over there. Um, uh, Graham's here to talk about uh, Iroko housing, um, one of the precedents that uh, we have been analyzing not only this semester, but also in the previous uh, semester. So uh, it's a really a, a, an amazing opportunity to hear uh, from the architect who was uh, behind that project uh, uh, some time ago. Um, um, uh, uh, Graham's company, uh, Howard uh, Tompkins, who, uh, founded by uh, himself and uh, his partner, uh, Steve Tompkins, uh, is uh, practicing for, I think, approximately 30 years, um, has um, received uh, numerous uh, awards, uh, uh, including the Reba Sterling Prize in 2014. Uh, it's, um, it's produced some of the very important uh, housing projects, but uh, also uh, other uh, uh, uses, other uh, typologies. What is really interesting about Iroko, I think this is one of the very first um, collective housing uh, projects that uh, uh, they have done. And uh, from there on, they've uh, uh, continued. Um, I will uh, not hold uh, uh, you for much longer. I'll hand it over uh, to Graham. I just want to say that, uh, as usual, we will try to uh, answer questions uh, after uh, Graham finishes uh, his uh, talk. So please uh, use the uh, question and answer function uh, to send your questions. You can do that uh, as the lecture goes, and um, we'll either uh, take them uh, straight away or uh, leave them uh, for, for the end. But uh, please uh, use the opportunity and um, ask your questions. So. Um, that's uh, why uh, Graham's here. Graham, uh, over to you. Thank you very much again for finding time for us. Uh, an amazing uh, opportunity, and we're all very excited to hear from you. Oh, thank you. Um, so, hello, everybody, and um, good good morning. Uh, well, it's good morning from me. Um, it's uh, evening time where you are, which is kind of weird, uh, but um, it's it's really good that you you've come along to listen to this talk. It, it's it's basically going to focus on uh, the Roco housing scheme, uh, which, which for us is is quite an old project now. It's uh, we we won the competition in 1997, uh, which is sort of 24 years ago. But it was a very pivotal project for us. We were quite a, a small, uh, young emerging practice at that at that point. Probably had about 10 people in the office. And uh, we're now we've now grown to about 120 people, so we're a much different um, entity than we we were then. Uh, but Iroko was a very pivotal project because it um, we we won the competition at the same time as we won a competition for a theatre building as well, and that really defined the future trajectory of the the, the practice in uh, arts and culture and also housing. So it, it was a very important project. On on the screen now is is a scheme. Um, it's the sort of scale that we're working at right now on, on urban regeneration and housing. It's a scheme for Peabody, who are a um, registered uh, housing provider in London. And it's um, about 17 buildings altogether in, in Fish Island, which is quite close to the Olympic site. And it's um, designed to be um, a residential mixed use neighborhood uh, with employment space um, at the lower levels. And it's, it's going to, the, we're just fitting out the employment space at the, at the moment. The third phase is almost complete. And this is going to have um, what's called a fashion hub. There's a, there's a big uh, incentive for um, industry in, in London right now. And the, the a fashion hub founded by the British Fashion Council is gonna occupy most of the base and ground floors of these buildings. So that's, that's really exciting to mix mixed uses. So this really is just by way of illustration of the journey that we've we've been on since since Iroko and the sort of scale that we're, we're working at now. Uh, we do a lot of um, housing regeneration schemes for uh, social providers. So a lot of our housing is affordable uh, and market rent. Um, so it's very important for us to make sure we're providing homes for, for the people that need them. But we're, we're also interested in, through our other work in the practice, we, we're not sort of housing specialists in that sense. We're general practitioners in a way, in, in terms of um, architecture. So we have a very strong uh, arts and cultural background. 
Uh, we do a lot of master planning and, and we're interested in placemaking and creating sustainable communities and, and livable cities. So the, the image on the left hand side is one of our uh, theatre projects that we did, a, a temporary theatre for the National Theatre, which is literally one block away from Iroko housing. And it, it gives you the sense that housing is, is in the context of the city inexorably linked to culture and, and life and, and, and people. And it's something that's very important for us to create living streets and exceptional places. We're also interested in creating a, a diversity within the city. Um, there's a, a, a danger in in the scale of, of new development that there isn't enough diversity within buildings that they all look the same and they don't create uh, buildings that, that get better over time so there's, that's just a little bit of the background as to the sort of themes that we're, we're interested in in our residential work <clears throat> so this is an illustration of uh, iroko housing um, as i said it was it was one in a, an invited competition in 1997 uh, we were quite a young practice then, we, both partners were, were, in, we were in our early 30s, so we were just beginning to get going. So it was, it was really important break for us. Um, and it was, it was a very simple concept, really, of, uh, of a building uh, that was focused on a central space to create a sense of community. And I'll talk a little bit later about how the context of housing in London has changed since this uh, project was was conceived and and how um, it would be probably be quite different now I think if if we were to do the same scheme again so it's very much a project from its from its time from um, the the late nineties sort of early two thousands and the, the the housing was completed in in two thousand and two so the site is is very central the the bridge that you can see in the left hand side of the shot is waterloo bridge so to the left of that is the hayward gallery and the royal festival hall and then to the right is the national theater and that's now for those of you who've been to london that's a very busy public route uh, along along the river it's very active um, with various arts and cultural activities and as you move back away from the river, the, there's a lot of um, different sites. The, the character changes quite, quite dramatically. So our site is, is highlighted uh, with the, the yellow horseshoe shape and the, and the red piece in, in the center. And that, that was called Site B. But it, it was part of um, a, a bigger complex uh, that stretched from Waterloo Bridge right over to the river. And there's a building called the Oxo Tower Building, which is at the top right of the, um, the, the space there. Um, so really the, the, the whole site that was owned by the, the client uh, was contained by the, the larger yellow uh, space uh, shape. And we were asked to look at one proposal in, in the center of that. The rest of the, the scheme was, was derelict sites, um, building sites, that sort of thing. And one thing that was really important was the sort of political context that our particular client came out of. They were very much a grassroots um, community organization. Uh, and in the, they, they started in the late 70s, early 80s, when um, there was a lot of uh, political un unrest in the UK. And they, there, was no, there was a big housing shortage, there was big unemployment and lots of dissatisfaction. And, and what was really interesting is that people sort of took to the streets in a way to protest a lot to actually get people to change and get central government to put more uh, initiatives into housing um, also in in the context of that thing there, there was also a lot of youth cultural change in terms of punk and the, we had riots and those other things so the context that the the, the building was uh, the, the the initiative came out of was was very much um uh, post-industrial low economic um issues and, and, and really sort of a lot of unrest. So in some ways it, it came from a very negative set of values in, in a way. Uh, this was the site prior to the demolition um, of, of the existing buildings on the site. And the National Theatre is the, in the top right-hand corner. And the large white tower in the center is at London Weekend Television. So that's a television studio and office building on top. And basically civilization ended at the LWT tower in, in, when this photograph was taken. You, you couldn't get along the river beyond, beyond this point. And this was a sort of transition between the 60s and 70s industrial landscape that occupied central London right, right into the center. So factories, warehouses, post office distribution, uh, buildings, that sort of thing. Very 
raw industrial buildings. And a lot of these were redundant. The, the industry had moved out from these areas to satellites uh, around the city and around uh, further out towards uh, the Docklands area. So there, there was really a, a lot of interest in how these sites would, would develop in the future. And th this particular site was subject to a, a scheme that Richard Rogers did for a developer where he was proposing to create a, a necklace of office buildings which went from Waterloo Bridge right the way across our site and then created this sort of arc um, where the Oxo Tower building is now. And the proposal was to demolish the Oxo Tower and create this new gateway across the river uh, with a new bridge. And, and the site of the bridge, incidentally, was, was very similar to the, um, the Millennium Bridge that Thomas Heatherwick uh, attempted to build across the Thames a, a couple of years ago. So this was a very ambitious project. Uh, there was no housing in it, it was purely commercial and it, it ran into quite a lot of local opposition. And what uh, the central government did is they basically said, the sites were owned by the, the, the GLA or the GLC as it was then, which was the London Council. And this was the, the Rogers scheme. You can see the, the scale of it. So the, the scheme at the bottom, they, they demolished the OXO building, but kept its little tower and then built these sort of mini Lloyd's buildings, really, of sort of 10, 12 stories, uh, and then a, a necklace of other buildings that, that sn sneaked their way around behind the London Weekend Television Centre through to the Waterloo Bridge. And there was a, there was a big sort of uh, initiative on public open space and gardens, and, it, and in some ways it was a very positive scheme, but it, it didn't provide anything for the local community. So the GLC basically set two schemes up in opposition, a local community scheme and, and this scheme, and let them fight it out, basically. And whoever got permission and funding um, could, could go ahead and develop the site. And this, this very optimistic Rogers scheme coincided with a, with a big recession in the, in the UK, and it, it, commercial space just wasn't viable for that period. So it sort of fell by the wayside. And uh, our client, um, Coin Street Community Builders, were successful in, in getting uh, ownership of the site and um, then went, went forward to, to create uh, a funding vehicle to, to develop it. So their, their motto became there is another way to, to develop this, this site and, and create community housing. And it was very much a grassroots initiative. This, this was one of the committee members um, called Reginald, who was very vocal in our competition entry and he, he lived on the adjacent site. So they, they, they were very, um, uh, sort of involved really in the, in the whole briefing and community process. So the site that Reg lived in was, was the one that they developed first, which is a very sort of unambitious uh, proposal, I suppose. It's this, this um, courtyard site at the bottom here. And architecturally, it was quite low grade. It wasn't particularly interesting, but it did put them on the map in terms of being able to practice uh, how they might redevelop the other sites. Our site is um, <clears throat> marked by the red rectangle in the centre. And prior to, to our competition, there was a, another competition for a site which a firm called Lichrich Davison did, which is just out of shot here, which is a really elegant row of uh, townhouses and a small um, little tower on the corner. And that, that, that was in, in place, as was the renovation of the Oxo Tower building. So there were, there were three projects that beginning to gain momentum on, uh, on, on the site. The, the other aspect that Coin Street had is that they created this community garden called Burning Spain Gardens. And then they had a meanwhile uh, pop-up market here, which is still in existence. And then they've got really big ambitions for this site here, which is called the Dune Street site, where they wanted to put a leisure center and a, a, a tall residential tower on. But again, that, that's just subject to, to future funding. So I'm just gonna concentrate now on, on the central site and our, our design proposals uh, for Iroko. Um, so the competition stage, we, we investigated uh, a series of sort of urban moves, whether, whether we could create um, a traditional street pattern, whether we could create uh, individual blocks that, that moved across the site. And it, it, it became very clear to us that we really needed to respond to something uh, on the site of a, of a particular scale uh, to actually create... Um, something that could hold its own in the context of all the other large-scale buildings around. So we, we've settled on this notion of a, a hollow square, which was quite a defensible urban form in that it created a private space in the centre and um, a, a tough perimeter which could sort of 
provide defensible space along the street edges as well, and a very clear definition. And then another part of the brief was to integrate 30% um, of the site approximately for, for community uses. So we came up with this notion of locking the community facilities building onto the, the edge of the, um, the housing to create this quite large uh, hollow square, which is about 80 meters across. And um, Roger uh, mentioned earlier that you've been doing some scale comparisons of Iroko on, on the site you're working on. So it, it is quite a, quite a, quite a large uh, site to, to deal with. So that was the overall concept. The, the, the building, uh, because the site was previously occupied by um, a factory building, there was a basement. So there was a requirement for um, some car parking on the site. So we, we built a 360 space basement car park underneath access down a ramp. And interestingly, this provides quite a lot of revenue for the for the community builders in terms of income. So it was something that helped to cross subsidize subsidize the development. And then we um, we came up with this this idea of a series of uh, houses basically that that lined the the courtyard. And then on top of those houses, on the taller block, we would uh, put a series of maisonettes. So I'll show you the different typologies in a second. And then onto this uh, configuration, we, we attach the uh, idea for the community building. So that was the, the, the architectural concept for the competition. And then when, when we won the competition, we then started to sort of work into the proposals and, and trying to develop the, the, the housing typologies and to see how the community building might, might integrate with the, the landscape in the center. And you can just begin to see on this, this sketch diagram, um, the emergence of the private gardens at the back of the houses. The, the fact that the, uh, the houses are, are very linear in, in rows. Um, we had two different housing widths. I think we had about 4.2 metre wide houses uh, down the side streets. And then on the other street, we had 5.2 metre wide houses. And then on upper ground, which is a road that faced uh, LWT, we, we increased the scale of the building. So we had three storey houses. And on top of that, we placed these two storey maisonette typologies. And we had two circulation entry points to the upper accommodation, so staircases and lifts. Um, this changed actually in the final design to a central access point and two perimeter cores at, at, at each end, which created these, these little corner blocks. And you're just beginning to see the, also the interaction between the community building and the central landscape space. And these definitions of, of routes and circulations uh, zones around the space and the central space becoming a communal facility which could be used by all the residents and also potentially have spill out from the, um, uh, from the community building to the, to the east. So that was the first phase configuration. So you can see the, the definition of the housing here. So the three, three story houses on the side streets, which actually had a, a little roof terrace as well. So they had this bonus room uh, sitting on top which was, was quite enlightened by the client um, in terms of getting maximum family accommodation in those houses, but also um, allowing them um, opportunities for home working and things that, that have become much more prevalent uh, since COVID has, has come on the scene. So they, they were quite ahead of their time in terms of their amenity space. And each of the houses had their own private garden at the base, and then they opened into this uh, central community space um, in, in the center of the garden. And then this site was, was vacant. This is where the community buildings subsequently went. And this is the taller block. So this is um, a three-story block, again, with two-story maisonettes on top. And the maisonettes are accessed by this uh, internal gallery space. Uh, so externally, you can see how the, the form of the building um, held its own in the streetscape. It, it set up against some quite tall existing buildings and, and created um, a very strong identity for the building. And then inside, we contrasted the, um, the approach by, by going for a, a much more um, organic and, and um, landscape orientated treatment. So the materiality of the building has an outside facade of, of, of brick and an inside facade of timber. And you can see there that this is when the building was, was literally just finishing uh, being built. The, each dwelling um, has its own garden and then where we have the central entry point we we try to acknowledge that this would become more public so rather than have a little fence there this had a, a really strong concrete wall which we grew plants up and then we had these series of 
landscape planters and play spaces, which, which got inhabited over time. Um, each uh, upper room had its own balcony and the actual space standards in the houses compared to what space provision is now in, in affordable housing is really high. Uh, we wouldn't probably be able to afford a balcony for each room, for example, now. Um, but because it was a uh, almost a self-build project, it, we, were, we were able to get um, better subsidies and, and better involvement from the end users early on so they could tailor their requirements um as, as they went along these these are the side street houses so there are three stories so gardens at the bottom uh, a first floor living room with a bedroom on the street side and then two bedrooms there and then this this extra bedroom slash work, work at home space on the roof with a little roof terrace and then the corner units they they work in a very different way they they predominantly face outward to the street with with some uh, bedroom windows looking into the courtyard and i'll, I'll show you the plans of those in a, in a second um, we, we, we were big on, on natural ventilation and, um, and solar panels. We were, we were, it was very early stages of, of a green agenda and sustainability in, in buildings. I mean, that, that again has come on a long way uh, now, but we were trying to do as, as much as we could in terms of uh, renewable energy sources at this point. So that's just the configuration again. You can, you can see the, the links to the garden. So every, every block had access to the, to the garden through its own space. And then the corner units had access to the garden through these, these little passageways in, in the landscape. So everybody has access to the central garden. And this is the main, the main access point to, to the, the courtyard from the outside. There's a lift and a staircase in that, which takes you up to the upper floor maisonettes and there are two cores here that serve the corner units and also provide means of escape for the upper floor maisonettes. So the pink accommodation is sitting on top of the, the housing. And in cross section, the, as I said before, the whole thing sits uh, over a basement car park. We planted this really large tulip tree, which we took through the car park to, to get in contact with the, with the ground, which has, has been really successful. And then we set up this very strong datum across the site. So we had this three story datum and everything above that sort of popped up. So the pop up roofs on the side buildings were sitting above that datum. And then the two story maisonettes were accessed from a, a gallery walkway along there. And again, the, the, the idea of, um, of gallery accommodation where you, you actually access uh, dwellings from galleries or decks or deck access is its, its negative terminology. Is becoming much more prevalent now in, in the in the proposals we're doing we we did it here uh, at a time when it was deeply unfashionable and there was lots of reactions against the 1960s deck access proposals but because uh we were dealing with quite a small community i think we've only got like 12 or 15 dwellings accessed from that gallery it it felt really appropriate that the the community that used the gallery were, were, were quite it's quite small and intimate, so you didn't get these um, <clears throat> negative social connotations that you get with deck access in larger housing schemes. So whenever we use uh, deck access now, we try to limit the number of units off it and create um, smaller communities within it. So this cross section is also interesting because it shows the, um, the community building, which has a nursery, creche and offices for Collins Street in it. Uh, it's also got a function room, which pops out into the landscape and a, and a really large um, roof terrace, which can be rented out for social spaces. And again, environmentally, this was an actually ventilated building. We, we created these uh, solar chimneys, which face south and, and draw air up through the building and vent it naturally. So we're really looking at pa passive systems. So in terms of the, the, the way the plan form works is um, the series of three rows of houses effectively, and the ground floor of the corner units where we had apartments was a retail space. So this has been developed into a florist and this has been developed into a, a sort of local convenience store, food store. And the access to the basement car park is, is in each corner. So there's a lift and staircase access to the car park there and a lift, uh, 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 sorry, a staircase access from the car park on the other corner. So they, they work in a sort of symmetrical fashion. Uh, the bin stores are located in the corners too and they can be accessed from the street in terms of uh, taking away the rubbish. And this is the main access ramp down into the, the basement car park. Uh, the corner units typologies were, were quite successful. So on the ground floor, we managed to accommodate the, um, the ventilation units to the car park by taking the air up through the building. So these are, these are ventilation slots. 
as are these large uh, diaphragm walls in the center. So we don't have any uh, external louvers to, to speak of really on the, on the outside of the building. And then the staircase that takes you down to the car park exited to, uh, at street level and didn't, didn't interface with the, um, with the private spaces. So the housing, houses are quite simple. We created these recessed lobby spaces to create um, a place where, where, where people could um, sort of put buggies and shopping as they came off the street and they're, they're gated. And then there's a quite a large um, storage unit for boots and bags and things inside that gated uh, space and, and meter boxes and various things like that. There's an individual bin store for each dwelling, which is freestanding in a, in a sort of sculptural um, object on, on the outside. When you come into the dwelling, there's a downstairs, downstairs loo, kitchen and living area that opens into the garden, and then a staircase that takes you up to the next floor. And the, the wider units work on exactly the same principle, but they're just slightly uh, wider and they create a, a different, different mix. And this is, this is the route down from the flats above uh, through the little passageway into the, into the courtyard garden. And then the next floor above, um, we had a, on, on, on this street side, we had a, an extra living space. And on the courtyard side, we had two bedrooms that, that access into a, um, an external gallery. And the same on the, on the wider units, again, extra living room, two bedrooms, and then the external terrace. And the, each terrace was separated by a glazed, glazed privacy screen. And then the, the flats were, uh, these are actually walk-up flats, so there's, there's no lift access to two of the units. Um, so this is a little one bed with its own external street terrace, and this is a, a two bed with one bedroom overlooking the street and, and one bedroom looking over the courtyard. And then a kitchen dining area that look, look both ways. They're really, really sweet little units, those. And then as you go up the building and get to the access gallery level, so remember there's a central staircase and lift which can take you up and then you can walk along this gallery and into, into your dwelling. So we've literally just got two units um, at, at either bookend of the, of the housing terraces. And these are, these are maisonettes. So you come into the entrance, there's a kitchen living area, a, a single bedroom or a study room, and then you go up a staircase to the upper floor. And then these, these units overlooking the courtyard are also maisonettes. So you come into the staircase, it takes you up to the bedrooms on top. And this is the little pop-up room, rooftop room, sitting on top of the three-story houses along the two side wings, access from the staircase, and then onto, um, onto the roof terrace overlooking the garden. This is the upper floor of the apartment. So the internal staircase takes you up to um, a really nice set of bedrooms overlooking, one overlooking the street, one overlooking the courtyard. And then this is the, the roof of the side wings. You're just beginning to see the solar panels and the heat recovery units that we put into to each dwelling. So in terms of where the ideas came from for, for our competition entry and the, the way we developed the design, there's a lot of precedence in, in London for uh, communal garden squares. So a lot of them are Victorian and Edwardian, like this really large example over in, um, in Holland Park, which is Stanley Gardens. So each of these big dwellings was designed um, to have you know, quite serious uh, private defensible space on the street edge, but a very open um, organic response to the communal garden at the back. So it works on exactly the same principle as what, what we put in our competition, a hard urban exterior, and a, a softer landscaped interior. And the, these are actually open at either end. They're not completely closed squares. They're a series of terraces, but they're, they're gated along the end. And then there are also other precedents that we looked at. This is a traditional gallery access block that uh, Peabody and other registered uh, landlords were doing at the turn of the 19, you know, 19, um, 1890s, 1900s, early Edwardian period. These buildings were very prevalent in London for, for uh, low-income families and workers' accommodation, and they, they often had quite grand entrances into central courtyard spaces, so there's this hierarchy of communal space and, and private defensible space in terms of circulation, and they do get, they get inhabited, the, the terraces get inhabited with washing, bicycles, uh, and that sort of stuff, and we, we were in, really interested in that, that aspect of the proposal, this, this idea that um, the building could deal with the, the junk of everyday reality and, and people's everyday lives. And we were really interested in some of the early vernacular buildings in, in, in China, for example, which created communities within them 
and manage to deal with um, lots of sort of complex issues of, of, of ownership. So the, the Hutongs in Beijing were also quite a, quite a big inspiration in terms of how we could get people um, to, to live in the houses and, and feel that they could um, uh, appropriate them and populate them with, you know, with bicycles, pots and things like that. So the, these were, were quite strong influences. And in terms of reality, it, it proved really uh, successful. Um, so everybody has their own private garden. They can store bicycles in there. They can begin to inhabit, inhabit the, um, the landscape terraces. And interestingly, um, some years ago, I took a, a group of Dutch architects around the site and they, they were, had a very different take on the, the privacy gradients. And they were quite um, critical really of, of the English tendency to have their own private back gardens. And in, in Holland, they said they would just have a really low wall and it would be much more open and, and transparent to the communal space. So it's quite interesting how different cultures um, have different sort of ideas of, of privacy and community. But there really is a lot of life going on in, in residential accommodation. And I think it's something that we really took on board by working directly with the community builders. We'd never designed a housing scheme before. So we had a, a level of naivety, I think, that, that helped us really interrogate what the brief was. So we knew that the building would had, have to take a lot of junk, a lot of washing lines. Uh, it had a lot of Asian families uh, as well, uh, Bengali families who grew their own vegetables. Um, and we needed to provide uh, space for that. And then we also knew that, you know, people, there, were, there were family houses, so they, people have a lot of um, um, stuff, really. I mean, I, I don't know whether everybody has a bag of onions in their entrance hall, but that's the sort of thing that we knew was, was going to be needed in, in these houses. And how do, you, how do you sort of provide accommodation for that without it ruining the design? So we, we, we took that head on and, and really created these, these really large recessed um, so entrance uh, gates um, into into before you got into the dwelling, there was a space really like a, like a hall, but an external hall or a little yard space that people could store things. And then we had to deal with security as well. So that how how could you stop people breaking into those spaces? And so we you know introduced mesh to to make sure people couldn't put their hands around and open the escape latches and things like that. So there was a lot of design that went into to the detail uh, proposals. Um, and, and what's interesting is how, how the building's weathered over time. As, as I said earlier, it's, it's over 24 years old now since, since, we, uh, since we started the competition. Uh, and it, it's really weathering in nicely. So this was a, a, a practical completion just when the building was finished. This is our, our brave new community moving in. And this is a shot about 20 years later uh, where the landscapers begin to grow, the play equipment's gone in. The, the timber is weathering down nicely and, and the buildings are, are maturing. And I, I think that's another aspect of, of design really is to, to know that they may start off like that and be quite precise and pristine, but they are going to actually need to mature into something that's much more uh, layered and nuanced and, and, and allow people to take in the habitation of them. So that's something again, that we're, we're very interested in as a practice, this, the journey that buildings go through from their design through to through their, their lives and in in many ways you know at 25 years the building is coming to one one end of its life cycle there are buildings that are less than 25 years old that are being demolished at the moment and it's really we think it's a really sustainable uh, approach to regenerative design to to build properly in the first place so that people love and and take care of where they're where they're living um and that, that sort of half the sustainability battle in, 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 in one piece. So you see the, the buildings are really mature now, the tree, the tulip tree has grown, um, the, the timbers begun, begun to weather and, and the kids have, have really um, started to, to, to sort of grow into it. And, and I think we, 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 we're trying to get some data on now on, on how the generations are working. So the, these kids would have now left home. They, they were probably uh, started their own families somewhere else. And it's just quite interesting to see what is happening to the houses. Um, and we're trying to get some data from the community group on that as to whether these existing residents have now moved somewhere else and the houses have been taken over by people with younger families again. It's quite an interesting part of the, um, this whole idea of regenerating the city. 
but you get some really spectacular views from the access gallery. I mean, this is um, th this is even more populated now. People have put benches out there and things like that, and they really take ownership of the spaces in front of them, and they can look down into the communal uh, courtyard. So these these are quite early early shots. So one of the key aspects of the, the design, which was, was really instrumental in, in making the thing work properly, was the introduction of the community building on the far side of the space. We did have quite a lot of um, antisocial issues with the central space for a while because it, it wasn't really being passively overlooked by something on the, on the south side. It was completely open. And we, we found that there was a bit of vandalism and the kids were digging up lights and things like that. And it, it really settled down once this building was built on, on the bottom of the site. Um, it forms the the end piece to the to the courtyard. It closes off the courtyard um, and it faces the the main street to the to the south. And this is the uh, the solar chimneys um, uh, screen, which 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 creates this uh, stack effect vent, natural ventilation system to the building. This is the the large roof terrace, and you can you can just see in the background the um, the Oxo Tower building, which Richard Rogers wanted to demolish. And that, that's the, the, the scheme that I mentioned earlier that Richard Davison have renovated and built. And you can just see the, the little other residential tower there, which is part of the, the, the whole development as well. So by creating this building, it, it actually uh, provides a lot of uh, social facilities for the, for the residential community, not, not just on this site, but on, on, in, the, in the neighborhood generally. So it's got a creche. Um, it has community facilities so people can rent the spaces and it's also got the offices of the community builders who, who run the site and do the, the rest of the development. We're, we're still waiting for, um, there's a third of this, um, it's, it's probably, this, this end building is a third of the development and, and half of that still hasn't, hasn't been built yet. We, we designed a building that could be built in two parts but they haven't been able to afford to close off the, uh, the, the whole square yet. Um, so that's still still vacant, and we, we've we've had a, a number of proposals. We're about once every two years, we do a scheme for that site to test out various things, and it's been lots of things from a, a temporary theatre to house Mamma Mia the musical into um, a small residential block, and uh, at the moment it's, it's still vacant. And the latest on that is we we've, we've just put in a, an outline application for. Um, um, uh, many of a residential block, but with a community space at the ground floor. So hopefully, um, before thirty years are up, the whole urban block will be will be complete. So that that's just a, a, a closing shot, really, to to sort of end with. Um, I think what what's really interesting about this proposal is that it came uh, at a very particular time, and I think. We now, the sort of schemes we're doing now, we, we're not working at this, at this height. There's a, there's a real push to, to go taller in, in a lot of schemes. Um, the, the efficiencies of buildings um, have become tighter. So I don't think, I think if we were to do this again, we would probably, instead of being three stories on the side streets, we'd probably be going up to sort of five stories at least. And then on the main block, maybe seven, seven or eight stories. Um, the sort of changes in the unit plans, I think it's very tricky to create affordable townhouses, and we're trying to do it on a, on a number of schemes, but we, the, you know, the, the, the level of residential amenity that these, these dwellings have um, is, is really quite high, and, and that, that's being pared back a little bit. So I, I think Iroko is, is very much um, a building of its time, and it although it's a little bit of an anachronism now in terms of what the pressures are to, to do affordable housing, I think it has lots of good qualities that, that are still relevant. And particularly uh, since COVID, uh, a lot of the, the emphasis on communities and green spaces and, and working from home has, has really benefited. And we've, we've had feedback that in the middle of the pandemic, this, this community really rallied together. And this, this um, development almost created uh, a sort of safety vessel for them to to actually consolidate and the the, the generosity of the open space and the amenities and the, the even the, the home growing and things like that really, really came into their own so in some ways it was ahead of its time and in some ways it's a bit of an anachronism that it's nearly 25 years old and probably you wouldn't build 
things in 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 the same way again but it's very it's a very unique development and we're, we're very proud of it and as i said at the beginning uh it was a very pivotal uh scheme for us in terms of the development of the practice so i'll, I'll hand back now that that sort of concludes the the presentation so i hope it covers most of the points that you're interested in seeing yeah thank you graham that was uh, amazing uh, it was really great i uh, hope you can can you hear me or in can mm -hmm. can you see me as well good so I'm just still struggling to understand how uh, the Zoom webinar works. Thank you so oh, much. I can see I can see you and hear you. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. That was really amazing. I'm really thankful for 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 the inside story and you know the 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 overall um, uh, uh, presentation, which included uh, how the building really looks like with uh, with people after uh, 20 years. It's really a, a, a sensational um, uh, opportunity to to see. So we have two questions from from our students. We can uh, let you have a drink of water and uh, relax <laughs> just to get some get some air before before we dive into questions. Maisie, Maisie Matthews has a really good one. Uh, she says, "Thanks a lot for the presentation, Graham. I was wondering if you could please explain a little more about the system that makes the Oroco housing affordable." Uh, yeah, if I can add to that, I, I think it's really interesting to hear about your relationship with um, Coin Street uh, community uh, builders and um, their role uh, as well in the in in the design, if there is such a role. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, the way the way that this um, the way that this this ca came about is that the the it's it's changed a lot since since the. Uh, the economic systems of Iroko um, were, were developed, but at the time, there was um, a body, a central government body called the Housing Association, and um, a, a registered landlord could apply to that group for for funding, basically. So similar to I think what's happening in Australia, the government is putting money uh, out there and available to people to to fund to fund projects, and I and I think that. I think the funding was quite high then. It's been cut back a lot since Iroko, so that's why they're having difficulty finishing off some of the other developments. But at that time, you could apply for a, a housing association grant, and that was um, uh, ratcheted against the number of units you were providing, the sort of units you were providing. So this is 100% affordable, which is a big, big tick, and um, you could get funding for that. Um, that that's been replaced by lots of other funding streams now, and there there's most one of the big drivers in London at the moment is the GLA, the Mayor's Fund for Social Housing. Um, so he set a standard of fifty percent affordable in in any development, and there are grants available um, from from the GLA. Um, so you get so much per per dwelling, and then there are other there are still other central government grants, but it, it has become much more difficult. <clears throat> to leverage 100% um, affordable grants. So most of the development models now work on a commercial basis where a developer will develop private sale units. And a lot of the, reg the registered housing providers like Peabody and Notting Hill, they've had to change their, their structure so they can no longer rely on 100% grant aid. They have to rely on uh, developer partnerships. So most of the big housing schemes we're involved in now they have a developer uh, who makes profit from 50% of the dwellings, so the private sale dwellings, and then the, um, the affordable is subsidized out of the profits of the development. And that's, that's where it gets very politically quite tricky. And that's why you get all these arguments about we, we can't afford 50% um, affordable uh, we can only provide 30. So there's lots of arguing between developers about how the affordable housing is provided. There's, there's not a problem providing them the market sale because they're, they're, they're sold. Uh, but there is a problem trying to keep the levels of affordability up. And it is sub, it's cost subsidized now from, from the private sector, which, which, has, which has its issues. Um, but as I say, there are still some grants for affordable through GLA and other central government bodies, but it has been cut back a lot since Iroko was, was developed. So that, again, is part of the fact that it's a particular um, development from a particular time. And I, I think they'd really struggle to, to fund that now. So the, probably what Iroko would be now is that 
most of the houses along the two side streets would be sold for a couple of million pounds, something like that. And then the, the profit from those would subsidize the corner units, which would be affordable or, or subsidize a couple of the houses. Uh, and we're working with Notting Hill at the moment on a big regeneration of the Aylesbury estate. And that, that's the same, the, the model that they use there. So we're on one group with, we've got four buildings. Uh, there's a tall 25 story residential tower, which is private sale. And then a lower um, apartment block, which is private sale, and then two affordable blocks uh, about the same scale as the lower affordable. Uh, sorry, it's a lower private sale. So it's basically 50-50 uh, split, and the the private sale is is generating the revenues to to fund the um, the affordable. But Eroco worked on a very different model. It worked on a, a sort of community-based funding scheme. And then the other thing that I just want to mention, I should mention, is the land values are also really critical in terms of generating the development. So basically, because of the situation with the, um, the GLC that I mentioned right at the beginning, where there were two rival schemes, they basically, one of... Um, Ken Livingstone was the mayor of, of London then, or is the leader of the GLC. And one of his last acts was to, to give away quite a lot of property in, in London. And he basically sold the, the whole of that big site uh, for very little money. Uh, I think it was like a million pounds or something, which was, which was nothing really. So basically, uh, Coin Street were gifted the site value and that enabled them to have a very different developer, development model. So rather than paying the full market value for the land, which would have meant that they had to provide more profit to, 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 to generate the affordable component, they, they had a gift of the, of the land effectively. And that made a huge difference to the development. So I think, I think Iroko is a very difficult scheme to sort of use as a, as a model right now. Uh, because it, it benefited from a lots of different eccentric foibles that were around at the time, which, which enabled it to, to work. Uh, but the model now is much more like the, for the first scheme I showed you on the screen, uh, the, the Peabody scheme in Fish Island is um, the, the, there's 30 percent affordable on that. And it's I think the 17 buildings, I think four of them are affordable. The rest are market sale. And there's also income from the commercial space for, for the fashion hub as well, which helps to generate the affordable subsidy. And then the other thing that Iroko had is had the car park as well. So the car park has generated revenue and the community building generates revenue. So you can't you can't have this utopia where nothing is paid for. Something's got to pay for it. And I think there is a big tension at the moment about why can't we just have affordable housing? And, and basically there's, there's, no, there's no vehicle for paying for it unless you, you actually create these, um, these partnerships with uh, private developers right now. Um, but the political scene in the late, eight, the late 70s, early 80s was very different in, in the UK. Um, and that enabled us, uh, these things to happen. So that was, that was a very long-winded, convoluted way of trying to simply explain how, how Iroko worked from a funding point of view. Um, but it is very complex. And, and just finally, what, one of the unique things about Coin Street Community Builders is that they, they were an entity that was created. So anybody can create a housing um, co-op. And then the, once you've got that co-op, you can then generate your own development. And it, it happened, it's beginning to happen a, a little bit more now in, in smaller schemes where people are creating, say, eight or nine families will group together to, to buy, buy land and they'll develop a, a self-build scheme. So that, that's becoming a little bit more prevalent now. So it's, it's coming, it's swinging back a little bit, I think. Okay, uh, I'll move on to the next question and it's going to be very different questions now. So uh, uh, Jeremy is asking about larger scale site conditions and he's particularly interested in the excavation and how that influenced the project. You just mentioned that uh, car parking is an important source of revenue to um, either uh, maintain uh, or at the beginning uh, to, to develop the scheme. So um, is there anything else about the car, car parking and how did that influence uh, the design? Well, the, the, the thing that influenced the design was there was an existing uh, basement structure that was uh, part of the previous buildings that were on the site. <clears throat> so the, the large warehouses on the site had this basement already constructed. So when, when the site was demolished, we had the infrastructure already in place. We didn't have to dig and we didn't have to remove the, the, the earth and the spoil from the excavation, which is very expensive. So we had this uh, basement for free. 
and it was really a question of how how that could be used so we could have tried to put community facilities in there sort of swimming pools or uh, gymnasia or something like that we couldn't put residential down we did actually have an idea of we sink we, we could sink the garden down so that you could come down off the street and into the basement that was there and, and have the garden at lower level um, but again that wouldn't have provided any revenue stream so the particular location of Iroko being so central in on the South Bank meant there was a huge demand for car parking and that they could get a, a pre-let deal with um, national car parks who operate the, the car park. And that would provide, again, it provided security for finance as well when they were coming to um, to, to finance the development. But, it's, but essentially the, the basement was there already. So the infrastructure was there and it made sense to use it. The fact that we used it for a car park was done through a series of appraisals and, and the car park was seen to be the, the one that would generate more revenue. I think if we would had a flat site with no basement, I think it would be quite expensive to, to excavate and that has to be taken into account in the development economics. So a lot of schemes where we've proposed basements in the past haven't, haven't gone ahead because of the, the cost costs about in the UK it costs about 25,000 pounds a, a space to create a basement so you, you end up with um, you know about three million pounds worth of cost just to just to build the basement and we, we, we've only been uh, we've done it on one scheme the, the scheme I just mentioned for Notting Hill has a basement but it, it's really because there's there's no other way of getting the car parking on the on the development and also we, we we're going really tall with some quite high residential towers which are able to cross subsidize the costs associated with that that basement so again infrastructure is a little bit like funding it's very specific and particular to the individual scheme and you you can't sort of generalize uh, about it you, you you have to make specific choices in relation to the criteria of your specific project you did speak a, a lot about uh, this, but Cassandra would like to ask you again, what are the important factors to account for when considering um, a social um, or community building side of the architectural project? So yeah, maybe if you can just revisit uh, the key um, uh, parts of the project that address this. Yeah, the... Um, well, one of the key factors of, of the doing a 100% affordable scheme is that in theory uh, the people that live there are in housing need and they 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 can't afford to get on the property ladder they can't afford housing so uh, quite a few of them uh, quite a few of them are, are come from quite large families they come from ethnic minorities often and you have to be able to accommodate a diversity uh, within the architecture and the, the, the key to that really is uh, high levels of amenity space, so good garden spaces, uh, good, good defensible space, so that you, you know, you're building at high density, um, people have their own territories that, that they, they, they feel that they can take ownership of, and then um, creating really high levels of uh, community space. So here, we've, each dwelling's got its own private amenity space, and then in the in the central courtyard garden that provides um, it, it provides over what the planning requirements are. So every every development you do has a planning requirement for doorstop, uh, uh, sorry doorstep play space, uh, under twelve play accommodation, and and those sort of things. So there are statutory levels that you have to hit. Um, but what what we try to do is try and interpret what that individual community needs. So in, in Iroko there was. Um, Quite a strong um, a Asian community as well. So the way that some of the units are designed, they have to have segregated kitchens and things like that, which you don't get in uh, in Western developments. And then just trying to accommodate what what I described as the the junk of everyday life is something that we we try to take on board as well. But but generally, the the you try to create privacy small community groups so you don't group loads of people together so if we had a hundred people accessing off that deck it would be a very different space and and people take ownership of it in a different way in fact they don't take ownership of it it sort of falls through the net and it just becomes a, a nuisance so trying to keep create small clusters and then then trying to provide amenity space that's of that's of, of good value so we've got a, a muga in the center which is a ball game area for for kids and that that's an important factor 
And then adjacent to that in the community building, we're providing other facilities that help people when they go out to work. So creches and uh, other support facilities. And the, the thing to remember with, with affordable housing is that the people that live there are there a lot of the time. They're, um, they're time rich and, and cash poor. They're very different to the sort of yuppies who you know just, just sleep in their flats, the very expensive flats and go to work in the city for, for 14 hours a day. So the community needs to be sustained through the day. Uh, and you need to provide facilities to do that. But I, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to gloss over the fact that we had, we did have a lot of problems with uh, social, um, you know, uh, antisocial behaviour. Um, when, when families were out at work, the kids would finish school at three in the afternoon, come home, invite all the mates round, break the mag locks on the central door, smoke marijuana in the corners, and we had people setting fire to mopeds in the central courtyard. It, for the first 12 months, it was an absolute nightmare, to be honest. It took a long time to bed in, and we had to change some of the security systems. And then the, the good thing is that the community who lived there became their own governors in a way. They, they had a committee, a garden committee, a, uh, other committees that helped to run the housing, and they could keep on, on contro in control of the dynamic. There was one problem family in, in one of the houses and they had the power to evict that, that family. After six months, they managed to move them out and that solved a lot of problems. And then when we built the community building, there was a lot of passive surveillance over the space. So there's, there's a sort of a level of detail that architects don't necessarily engage with uh, at the design stage because it, come, it comes after. It, it, you do your very pretty designs and your really nice courtyards and then you find that people are smashing them to bits and you try and work out why that is and why it's happening and, and to have a really strong client base and a, and, a, and a contact there so you can fine tune the design in the two years after completion is, is, is really important and it's something that isn't always factored into um, to designs. I mean we're, we're very lucky in that we, we have contact with the management groups that, that run the buildings after we've finished them and we can as I say we can fine tune things that we haven't quite got right but to, to create a, a working community is very complicated and it, it needs to work on a number of levels. It isn't just about the physical design. There's a lot of politics and, and um, group dynamics that you need to, need to work out. But we got through those teething problems and, and you know, the, the pictures that I showed 24 years down the line, the, the scheme is really bedding in to what you would find on a, on a normal street uh, in, in any city. It has a maturity to it now that proves that it's worked but not, not without its teething problems. I mean, I think that's the other aspect when you're designing a big housing queue, just to, just to be really realistic about what might look like a nice design idea won't work in practice because that community doesn't have the income to, to support that or, or whatever. And you have to be quite realistic about it. Uh, it takes quite a long time to learn actually that. I'm going to group um, uh, questions. <laughs> There's a group of people asking uh, related questions. They're not exactly the same. So Jeremy, uh, Rip, um, uh, Riva to a certain extent, and um, Yuyan uh, asking about how do you design uh, for different needs in terms of, you know, you, you, there, there are units, there are all mesonet or townhouses, but there are different families there, different structures of families, different number of people in the household. Um, um, how, how, how can you uh, address that within the design, sort of thinking about customization, adaptability, or maybe even changing the unit structure over time? Yeah, um, flexi flexibility is a, is a really interesting point. And we, we, what we tried to do is um, enable rooms to be subdivided. Or, or if you had two bedrooms that they could be made into a bigger space if you, if you needed them. But what the model we used on this particular development was a, as a traditional uh, Georgian or Victorian house, which has very strong defined party walls. And then within that, you have your sort of light structures that can be moved around. And, and the, the adaptability of, um, of traditional townhouses, which to us presented a really attractive model about how a, you know, an 1800s building from the 1800s is still relevant in the 21st century. And people, you know, there's a lot of demand for those type of properties because they are inherently flexible and they provide a very loose framework that people can convert and can knock around. And I, and I think that's the sort of territory of adaptability that we're interested in. 
rather than trying to build in uh, flexibility that people don't use. So it's the idea of creating a very strong structure. So very, um, very generous um, broad ceiling heights and good, good party wall conditions that can enable things to flex within, within that structure rather than trying to create a whole series of movable partitions a la Pompidou Center that, that never really works. And so it, it's just trying to build in flexibility in, in, in that sense. But, but on, on, this, on this scheme, it was very clear that the demand in, in the area was for family accommodation and houses rather than apartments. So that's what generated the typology. And the apartments, uh, they, they sit at a high level and they, they cater for a different group dynamic. So they tend to, tended to attract younger professional couples without children, for example, uh, the apartments, whereas the family housing was populated by um, you know, people that had three or four kids or something like that. So that the house typology and the large family unit typology suits that demographic. And, but there is still always a case for smaller one bedroom flats and studios, really, that people just need a small space, particularly if they have to buy it. So I, I think this idea of flexibility is, is, is really interesting. Um, some of the really innovative uh, things that are happening is, is going back to um, shell spaces. So in Holland, they, they're looking at this sort of super loft model where you create an oversized unit and um, then you allow that to sort of almost like an old warehouse conversion. You can convert and cut and carve that within that structure. And then we've, we've been looking at um, family group units where, again, we oversize them. So, I mean, we, we did a scheme recently where we, we created um, a number of houses for family members so um, traditional family structures, and they haven't been inhabited by families, they've been inhabited by cohabitees. So three, three young people rent, rent a house and live in it communally. And that's a really interesting model. It's like, you don't need a house for everybody because what, what, what we're doing is we're, we're multi-occupying the, the house unit. But I think, I think it's a really fascinating subject. It's, it's too, probably too deep to go into mm -hmm. right now, but I think if you're studying it, I think it's a really interesting, um, territory to, to look at, but, but I think the decision is whether you build tough infrastructure that can be knocked around or whether you try and create a, a building that just adapts. And we, we've had more success with creating a robust typology that can be knocked around by various owners over time, rather than try and, try and preempt what the flexibility issues might be with movable walls and things. So we're, we're sort of in the warehouse conversion camp and traditional house conversion, I think. I think I read somewhere that uh, Iroko is a community of 300 people, uh, out of which 150 approximately were children. So was there any specific consideration for um, kids' needs? Uh, you mentioned about the defense, defensive spaces, the overlooking of the um, central courtyard and uh, so on. Did that come into play throughout the design process? Yeah, and that, that, that's where the, uh, the community builders group, the, 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 the steering group that ran the project, from the briefing point of view and, and defining what, what our design would be, they were really helpful and instrumental in that because they, they had the housing scheme that I showed Reg standing in the garden of earlier without his shirt on. That, that's a scheme that they had similar issues with. They, they had to sort of get the community to work there and how can they accommodate children? They realized in that they didn't have enough play space, for example, so that's why we got our, our MUGA and uh, the actual under under fives place play area as well um but really the, their, their input was accessibility um to enable people to access the courtyard and then have have spaces for different generations to actually occupy so while the kids are playing in the garden they can either do that unsupervised because the garden gates just open onto it our parents can go out and sit in the area in, a, in an area slightly away from the play equipment so trying to create a complexity of, of offer was, was really important but the basis of it came from the brief that the community builders uh, put to us and most of our housing clients are, are very sophisticated now in terms of providing that information and detail to us I think from from a student design point of view, it's probably something that might not be might not be clear. So in some ways, what what might be quite good is for you to talk to a a housing provider in in, in Melbourne who deals with 
play space and deals with families and, and try and develop a brief specifically from, from them. It, it's usually about accessibility and space standards and, and proximity of space to, to dwellings, making sure it's the right thing. So people tend to prefer garden areas. Uh, we've done a few roof terraces and they, they, they can be successful, but everybody's got to go up to the lift to get to them. And when you're up there, you do feel quite isolated. Mm-hmm. So the, the preference for families is to try and be more on the ground, I think. And being conscious of the time, we'll take one last question, uh, and that one's from Will. And uh, you've mentioned this in, in your uh, talk earlier, uh, how different um, uh, cultures perceive boundaries in a different way. So what um, in Holland might be considered uh, as an open uh, sort of uh, threshold in uh, London or South Bank specifically, you would uh, have to put uh, the fence wall there. So. You know, the, yeah. the, these are different mechanisms in place uh, that our architects use across different places, different cities. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Dutch are very different to the English. They don't have any curtains. They, they don't close windows. They, they're much more open and, you know, they're, they're, quite, they're quite interested in undressing in front of full view of everybody else. The English are much more phobic and they need more, more sort of privacy, I suppose. Um, but it was just interesting when, when I took the, the Dutch contingent round that, that that was one of the observations they made. It was like, you've created this amazing communal garden, but you've still had to hang on to this private territory. And that feels sort of undemocratic somehow. It feels too private in terms of ownership as much as privacy. But one of the key uh, deb- debates we had at the competition stage was whether to make the uh, courtyard publicly as- accessible as a, as a route so to bring people through. And we, we thought that could be a fantastic idea that anybody could walk through it and see the housing and it became much more part of the, the overall public realm. But Coin Street just hated that idea. They just felt it would be really, really problematic. And I mentioned some of the problems we, we had with the gated courtyard um, in terms of antisocial behavior. They, they just felt it would be impossible to police that space if it, if it was open. And I think that, that's quite an important consideration as well. So as, as uh, the scheme that I showed you early on has got open courtyards, but it's very much part of the public realm. The, 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 it's not a communal garden, so people can walk through it. And we've got workspace uh, around the courtyard, so there, there's people looking after it all the time. Um, and then we're doing the, uh, another scheme at the moment where we've got a very similar condition to Coin Street, but it's a, a little bit more like Stanley Gardens, the, the Victorian precedent I showed you, the big white building. It's open on both ends, so people can see into the garden, but they, 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 they're toying with the idea of opening, opening it in the morning from 10 till 6 and then closing it at night. So, but it, they still have this issue of how do you get rough sleepers out? You know, they might hide behind the trees and be in there all the time. There is this issue of public privacy, which is quite interesting, that needs to be, needs to be considered, really. Okay, I think we've exhausted all of the questions that uh, we've had and uh, maybe time to conclude. Uh, Graham, thank you very much from myself and from the students. This was really amazing and really a privilege uh, to, to hear you speak about your work, a really beautiful project and a uh, really great, great lesson for, for us. Thanks very I much. I think it's fantastic that you, you're actually studying housing. I think that's really great that you're not all designing opera houses and things. I, I think it's a really interesting student thesis, thesis but it is... It is a very complicated, multi-layered uh, problem. So you can't you can't solve everything. But uh, I think it's a really good subject to 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 study. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if, if what I was going to offer is that if if any, I don't know what material you have, but if if any of you feel you need scale drawings or information on on any of our projects, we 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 can set up a portal where you could access those, and um, you know it might help some of the research you're doing. Yeah, that, that will be amazing. I'm, I'm sure the students who have done you, the precedent analysis on uh, Iroko housing are now asking why, why, why didn't I try to do this before? Because, you know, it's there's a lot of effort that they've gone through, and uh, they've done really beautiful uh, analysis uh, of, um, of of the material that is available. But thank you very much for for that. That's um, that's really a kind offer, and uh, we might take you on that. Thanks so much. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Thanks again for your time. I'll, I'll leave you. Leave you to enjoy your evening. Yeah, we get to your day. <laughs> I'll go now. I'll go and have some breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Cheers. very much, Graham. Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you. Okay. 
thanks everyone we are concluding the the talk and uh, thanks very much for for your attention still there's 50 people uh, uh, present uh, i'll just present